job or from job to job. All right, so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. We're going to have you guys muted during our conversation today, but if you have questions, you can put them in the group chat or you can raise your hand. I believe that there's that option as well. Um, and, but if not, then just put it in the chat and I will make sure that, um, that we get to your questions. All right, guys. All right, so Ryan, it's, it's all yours. <laughs> all right, thank you very much, Carrie. So um, <clears throat> just a heads up too, I am recording this um, for the library to be able to share um, later and share with people who may not have been able to make it tonight. Um, so just keep that in mind if you have questions, uh, uh, it will be recorded. And with that, I am going to share my screen with you. So hopefully, it works quickly and everybody can see the PowerPoint slide that I have up here. So, <clears throat> um, I think with that, I will just get started. So, um, transitioning to college. What does that mean? What are the, some things that you need to know from people who've done it successfully, people who've gone through it already, people who've learned along the way? Uh, and what can you do now, starting today on June 10th, to begin preparing yourself and thinking about college differently? So when you step your first foot on campus in the fall, you'll be able to get the most out of your entire experience. Uh, so first things first, congratulations, first of all, on graduating. I know um, with the pandemic, the uh, senior year was truncated for a lot of people and looked very differently. Um, now that I'm sure you anticipated back in August or even in January. Um, so I do have my uh, sympathy on that one for just things changing and being very different. So congratulations on making it this far. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, hopefully this is new information for some of you. Hopefully it's interesting information, something that will give you um, a little bit of stuff to think about when you do go to school in the fall. Uh, and then about the fall, really. Um, I'm sure you may have been receiving some communication so far from the university or college that you've chosen that um, everybody wants to be on campus and in person, but there might be um, some factors that come up in the meantime that change that. They might be switching to the, the phrase that I've seen a lot is high flex, uh, like a hybrid flexible mix of in-class and online or distance learning, um, sort of familiar to what you're doing or were doing now at the end of high school. I know I saw an article where Dr. Fauci said that he personally wasn't sure what the uh, status would be in the fall semester, but then um, a panel from Harvard said that there's a couple guidelines that they think you can follow to make sure everybody can do it safely and be back in the classroom. So for what we know now and for the point of this presentation, I'm going to present all of this starting with the idea that you will be able to be on campus in the fall back to pretty much close to a normal experience that you would have anticipated without the pandemic. And with that being said though, I will share my contact information when we're done here. Carrie has it as well if you wanna get in touch with her too. Uh, I do offer personal help. Uh, that's kind of how this all got started really. Um, so I can help you ma navigate you know, your individual school's guidelines uh, and help you create a game plan for what that would mean for you and what you should be doing um, with the new scenarios. So a little bit about me, um, for those of you who are with us tonight. So my name, as Carrie said, is Ryan McGowan. I am from Pittsburgh. I grew up here. Uh, I did K-12 to at South Fayette High School, uh, graduated there in 2015, and then I went to Cleveland for college. I went to John Carroll University, and I graduated there last May, 2019. I majored in finance, and I minored in computer science. Um, and a lot of my activities I did on campus were involved with um, helping people. I did, uh, I was a tour guide for three years, so that was really formative for me about learning good resources on campus and learning a lot about what colleges can do for people, uh, as well as reaching out and helping people, which I really enjoyed. Uh, I did a lot of service at John Carroll with being a Jesuit school. There was an emphasis on our service and giving back to communities, uh, so that really is a big passion of mine. Um, now that I've graduated, I work for Covestro out in Robinson. 
I started with them last June, just came up on a year uh, last week, and I'm in a commercial rotational program with them, which means that for 18 months from my start date, I rotate through six different jobs with different managers, different departments, different functions, and uh, get a chance to really learn as much as I can about the whole business, what they do globally. Um, and then after my rotations are over in January, in 2021, I'll be placed into a seventh full-time position as well. Uh, outside of work and outside of doing uh, this coaching business, I'm an avid golfer. I love to run and I love to read. So if you have questions about any of those things, feel free to reach out too. All right. So as I said before, I'm a recent college graduate. Um, I would say that I did college about as well as I could have hoped for. I had four great internships that were all paying. I had a great on-campus job opportunity. I got to study abroad. I did service trips, um, was in a myriad of different clubs, got a, a great job right out of school. Um, really think I did everything I hoped to do. I, I graduated with the um, distinction of being uh, winning the award for the highest academic achievement in the business college when I graduated too. Um, and I was a research fellow and I was the first one in our business college. So um, really happy with what I accomplished and what, what I did. And uh, I realized that everything that I was doing um, really wasn't because of anything special that I had. It was just, I started doing things early on campus that really paid, paid out big dividends later. Uh, and there's things that I realized looking back were, were really easy stuff to do. And so that's what this program is all about is I distilled, you know, my four years of mistakes and successes and talking with friends who also made mistakes and had their own successes and created this um, series with six pieces of information that I think um, by no means are groundbreaking and do I claim them to be um, completely unique and, and new to the world, but they're ones that just presented clearly give you a roadmap for what you can be doing your first month, your first semester. Um, to really put yourself on solid ground and make sure that you get the most out of your time in, in college. So the first one is asking for help early and often. I know that sounds really basic, um, and hopefully it is to you because you're already in that practice now, um, but I'll go through a little bit more detail about how, ways you can do that, why it's so important, and share some experiences about why it helped me. Next, you want to focus on trying new things first. Uh, that's really the whole point of college is try to broaden your horizons. So that's what we're going to um, work on today. Don't stress about the roommate situation. I know it's only June. Most schools probably haven't even told you yet what your re residence is going to look like. If you're going to have one or two roommates where you're going to live. Um, I want to say that's just something that I know a lot of people going into their first year worry about. And it's not a cause for concern. And I'll lay out some ways to deal with that, which is how you can look at it more positively. Next would be connect with upper level students. Uh, so you going in as a first year student, there's so many activities your first couple weeks to really help you meet people in that first year class and make sure that you know, everybody's together. Um, and that's all great because you that's the group you're gonna be the closest with. However, it's really important to branch out and meet older students. And um, we'll go over more of that reason why too later. Uh, next schedules are your friends stick to them. Um, that looks different for everybody, uh, but the people I was around, and myself included, that managed it well and uh, were never too stressed and got through with a good mix of fun and education were the ones who had responsibility with their schedules. Uh, and then lastly, is work on your financial literacy. Uh, I know that's not, not often something that's talked about when you go to school, but um, it's really easy to make mistakes just because you don't know. Uh, and some of those mistakes can last for much longer than your time in college. So we'll talk about a little bit of the overview of what to look out for and um, how you can be better with that from day one. All right, <clears throat> so step one, ask for help early and often. I'm sure everybody has heard this before, that no man is an island. And a really famous starting line from a John Donne poem. Um, and I think it's really important to, to keep in mind. And especially when you are going to college, because um, I like this picture for it because you see this island, it's lush, there's so much greenery, it looks like there's a lot of resources that could be on it. And that's really what college is too. You walk in to campus for the first time, and it's really amazing how much is on that campus and how much is there for you. 
Uh, and it only works though if you ask it to work for you. So uh, asking for help. Remember that college is a brand new environment and it presents brand new challenges. So you're not an expert, that's perfectly okay. In fact, it's established that you're going to struggle, you're going to not know what's going on. I know I was like that. Everybody on my floor, my residence hall for, uh, for my first year was like that too. We were all just going about it together. No, nobody knew what, what was happening. So that's okay. So if you can be prepared for that now and start thinking about things that matter to you, that's where it makes all the difference because you don't have to just be swimming around aimlessly. You can start tracking down the resources that will provide you the answers and allow you to move on and deepen your understanding of things, find new interests, really accomplish a lot of the things that everybody says college is for. You can only do if you are able to ask and just make sense of the world around you. And knowing where to go is half the battle. Um, it really, it's one thing to know that you need help and, and hopefully uh, after this presentation and just over the summer as you're thinking about what you might wanna do and um, then once you get on to campus after orientation and you see what's out there, hopefully questions do develop and, and you're curious. Um, I really do hope that you, know, you have that kind of desire to learn and, and see new things when you go to school. Uh, and it's all well and good, but it only works too if you also know what to do with that curiosity, what to do with that um, desire to know more. So you have to know where to go to ask those right questions. So here's a list of some resources that I've put together based on my time, as I said, as a student, as a tour guide and answering these questions for prospective students and first year students all the time. Um, these are the, the nine spots or 10 or 11, depending on how you want to count some of them, where I really have seen the most amount of questions being asked about, where I've seen help sort of behind the scenes a lot for students and they probably didn't even know, you know these groups are doing that work for them uh, or lastly, personally benefited from. So uh, just running down them, the first one is office hours. That is the most important place for you as a student in your academic career, I think. It, office hours, for the, if you're not familiar with it, it, is the concept that professors have to be in their office for certain periods of time. It's mandated by the universities. It's typically a sliding scale, so the more classes they teach, the more time they have to be in their office. And it's your time to interact with them individually, ask them questions about material, uh, challenge them on ideas that you've had, or maybe you didn't agree with something they said in a lecture. I mean, it's, it's fair game just to talk to them about what you want to talk to them about. That's what they're there for. Um, and it really is the best way for you to get your questions answered succinctly, honestly, and walk away with a good relationship. There's something that uh, personally I just, I like talking to people, I'm really extroverted, so I never had a problem going to office hours, um, especially earlier in the semester. So that would be a huge recommendation. Um, it's one thing to go to an office hour session with a professor, but the meaning of it and uh, sort of the bond that you might have with a professor is cheapened if you only go, you know, the session before an exam or right before an essay is due. Uh, you, you really see the most benefit from office hours if you go in the beginning of the semester when majority of the students, maybe even you know, three quarters, 80% of the students don't care about the class or the professor yet. Go in and say hi, just introduce yourself, especially if you're in a larger class. You'd be really surprised at how much of a difference that can make over the course of your semester, even your time in college, and, and, and even your professional career beyond that. Those relationships are really important, and in my eyes, that's what you pay for when you're paying for school. So you're paying for access to these people who are very strong in their field with good connections. Um, for example, I'll give you two really good ones with how office hours are impactful. Um, my first year, I went to the office hours of my advisor just to check in and say hi and I kind of just introduce myself and start asking some questions I had about um, a track that I was creating because I wanted to study abroad, but I wanted to also do this minor that was outside of the business college. And, wanted to just run all this stuff by him as quickly as I could so that I could make a plan. And I, I realized that, you know, he had a little like toy golf bag and clubs on his desk. So we got talking about that. And, you know, I basically took up his entire office hour session because no one was there waiting to speak to him. And I built a great relationship with him. And then after that, he ended up becoming one of my favorite professors. I took his classes and he's the professor who created the research fellowship for me my senior year. So that is really 
a unique and it was an awesome experience for me that only happened because I had this personal relationship with the professor. And that only happened because I wanted to say hi and speak to him during office hours. So that's why it's really important. Um, it's like think about like the dominoes falling. If you just kind of open the door, start speaking to them and build that relationship, you'd be really surprised at what that last domino is gonna look like because you can't even imagine it You know, in August of your freshman year, September of your first year. Uh, the other example that was really helpful for me was office hours is right before finals week of my fall semester, my senior year, I concussed myself pretty badly. Um, and I didn't know how to address that really because I had a final like on Monday and this was like Friday afternoon. And I ended up calling the assistant dean of the business college because again, I'd always gone in to see her, talk to her. She helped me plan my study abroad with my advisor and like just really got to know her very well. I called her and I explained what happened, just confused. I didn't really know what to do. I couldn't read. Uh, and she sent me home and she said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it and we'll catch you up and like we'll manage it. So I trusted her. I left and I got all the emails from professors that you know it was cool that I left and uh, I could make up the finals later when I could think straight again. Um, and so I mean, I'm sure other students would have had accommodations made for them and things would have worked out, but um, not as easily as it did for me. And that's because you went to office hours and you get to know them and they will help you because they see you as their friend and as a person, not just as a number or a seat in their class. So those are my short examples, um, but hopefully they're powerful enough to, to convince you just to go in and say hi, because they're bored in their office, I promise you. They just want to talk to you. That's what they're there for. Uh, so use it. Uh, the next one is the financial aid office. Uh, you might think, you know, when you get your acceptance letter and you get your aid package that you're done with financial aid, that is, could not be farther from the truth. You will never be done with the financial aid office. So know where that is, know how to get help from them. And also, you know, to try to build some relationships and see them because whenever there's a problem, it's typically pretty urgent and it's also typically affecting other students too. So they get very busy in very select moments of the semester. So it's really good if you can know them and just be cordial with them in advance because it helps everybody out very much. Next is a registrar. Um, oftentimes this is a different part of campus than the financial aid office. Um, some, some places it's rolled into one, other places they could not be further apart from each other. So just know where that is because once again, just like financial aid, if you're scrambling trying to find it when you really, really need it, it's probably too late to get the most amount of help you can. So the registrar, for those who don't know, it would be good for like adding and dropping your classes, changing your schedules, um, getting credits petitioned if you take AP classes in high school uh, and maybe um, maybe they're accepted for the credit count like towards graduation but they don't check boxes on uh, like your graduation requirement for your major uh, if you work with the registrar you may be able to get that changed as well if you can make a compelling case for your class that you took in high school um, that's actually another thing that I did as well with an AP European history credit is I worked with the registrar and like was able to change a, a core designation by talking to them and showing them syllabi from high school and projects that I did. And, um, again, so hopefully you're catching a theme here that one, nothing is ever set in stone. There's always some flexibility. People are willing to work with you, but only if they know you and if you advocate for yourself. So that's why you have to go ask for help early and just build those relationships. Next, Counseling Center. Uh, when I was at John Carroll as a tour guide, I, I think we always were given the statistic that about two out of five, so about 40%, of students during their time in college will go to a counseling center. And I think that's wonderful. Uh, it probably should be higher, honestly. So get to know where that resource is. Uh, it's confidential, it's free. And it, it can be everything from stress before exams, relationship counseling, homesickness, like they, they're there, other traumas, like they're there for everything for you. Um, and there's some very sweet people there. And it's another good resource that you're paying for already by going to the college. So just find out where it is. And even if you never need it, you might be able to help somebody find it. And that's also really important. Uh, moving on, we have the Career Center. Uh, so this is, I think, a place that too many people only think of as something for their senior year. And that's not true at all. The Career Services Center in most colleges is helpful for you even as a first year student. Uh, they will help you build resumes, especially if you don't have a lot of traditional work experience, like maybe you've only worked a retail job in high school, or maybe you've, you know, like helped like an, an aunt or an uncle like at a business over the summers in high school, like really nothing maybe that 
you would traditionally view as resume material, they can help you script it and pull out the real experience that's valuable. They also you know, have a job board, which is really helpful too for if you wanna to try to find an on-campus job, if you wanna find a job in the community, find an internship, um, go there early, go there often, and you can beat a lot of people to that application by just frequenting the place. So the Career Center is great. They can do resume checks for you. They can do mock interviews, help you practice and get better. And that's really the secret to a lot of the professional development stuff that uh, hopefully you're so interested in is um, you just have to do it a lot. Uh, same with like public speaking, same with you know, your major, those, those skills that you're learning, you only get good at it by repetition and the Career Center can help you practice and get good, get good at the skills that will land your job, which is also really important. Uh, the library, the tutoring center, writing center, again, some schools it's all kind of in one, some schools are very separated, um, but each very important to know. The library, as we all know, is fantastic. That one doesn't even need to be talked about too much more than we already know. Um, but get to, uh, ask the librarians questions, because oftentimes they have specific fields that they specialize in. So like if you're writing a research paper on history class versus maybe like a public health class, different people in the library are experts on that material and they can really help you. And again, they love to talk to you. Like they're there to help you, as Carrie can point out. People who work in libraries are awesome and they really want to help you out. So um, don't be afraid to go talk to them and ask for them for help too. Um, tutoring centers, most departments, most colleges within the, or excuse me, most schools within the university uh, will offer some kind of tutoring for you uh, throughout the week, just on a regular basis. So that's another thing you can ask about in office hours, like when that is. Um, you also can get that as an on-campus job later down the line, but something that's really helpful um, for when you're spinning your wheels and you're not sure what to do, just go to the tutoring. It's typically upper class when you've had your class, maybe even had it with that professor. They can offer you a lot of help. And I do know too that professors often check who's going to the tutoring because you typically have to sign in. Uh, and so if you're already going to office hours and then you also are showing evidence outside of just bothering the professor that you're trying on your own too, you'd be really surprised at how um, much more receptive they are to helping you in ways that you, you couldn't imagine. And whether it's like rounding grades up a little bit because they know maybe their test was a little hard and they like you or just helping you with internships that they maybe have heard about. Uh, a lot of opportunities can come from too. So check out the tutoring uh, and the writing center. Uh, a lot of schools offer this as well. If you want to submit papers to them in advance, they will help you with the syntax, with your diction, and clean up what you're saying to make sure your point is very cogent and very succinct. Uh, and they do a great job at that everywhere. The same thing with the tutoring center. Professors can check in. So it all just helps you look better. Uh, it's all free. It's available to you all the time. You just have to know how to use it and know when to use it. So keep an eye on those places when you go to school. The health center should go without saying, know where that is before you need it. Um, always good. They can normally do, you know, basic immunizations, a lot of free over-the-counter medicine, that kind of stuff. The diversity and inclusion office, really also good to know when you're going into school uh, to see what kind of work they're doing to help support different communities that are represented on campus um, and what you can do to be an ally of those communities and to help out uh, and to learn. So definitely keep an eye on those places. And then lastly, volunteer or the service center. Um, you're going to have more time than you think you have in college, and most schools have some kind of system in place to help you give back that extra time to people who really need it in the community around you. Uh, and some really eye-opening experiences can happen based on these free, uh, open experiences that the college is organizing on your behalf. So check those out early and often as well. You'll make some great friends doing it. Um, it's always good to help out in the community and, and see what you're not learning in the classroom and like what you can see with your own eyes around you. All right. <clears throat> so now next we're going to move on to the second main tenant and that's focusing on trying the new things first. And that sounds pretty simple, but seriously, try, look at the try new things as the first thing you do. And you got to find what you like and not what boosts a resume. That's one of the big advantages I think you have going into college is the big acceptance, the big application is over. You got into a school that you're happy with, they've accepted you, you're ready to start, and you're excited about what the future can, might bring. Uh, so now's a great time to now not pick things that you think would get you a job or would look really good to do. Find those things that you didn't know existed that you can't stop thinking about. Or if you have some things already coming out of high school that you really are passionate about, but you didn't have time 
to do them because you were too busy doing other like, standard things that would boost their college application. College is the perfect time to take those years and really see how far you can go in this field that you already know you love or you've already, always been interested in. You want to be growing all the time. If you're, if you're going to college and you graduate in four years, hopefully, or maybe five, and you're basically the same person you are from when you first matriculated on campus, then your experience was kind of worthless. So you, you really want to make sure that you're pushing yourself to be uncomfortable, pushing yourself to try new things so that you grow. Because that's where I think you find the best experiences overall. That's where you build the best friendships too. It's kind of like that stress of, of growth and the breakdown of older selves together really bind, bind, excuse me, binds a lot of people together. Uh, so you'll find a lot of your good friends from the groups that venture out and try new things. Uh, so you want to be on that side of things and just not be afraid to, to try it. Because if you mess up on a club or you mess up with a activity in college, it's not really that important. <laughs> like there's nothing will follow you around. It won't be a career failure. It won't like loom over you forever. Just, you know, if you play an event, it didn't work out all that great. There's enough other events that people will forget about and you can try again and try new things. So push yourself to grow. Remember that your comfort zone will always exist no matter what. So if you exhausted all new clubs, all new activities, and you really just were not fitting in any of them, you didn't like them, then go back to the things you liked already. Like there's nothing wrong with that either. But hopefully when you're done with, with your time in college, your comfort zone is expanded and is a lot less scary of a place to leave. I think is a good way to think about what you should be doing with your with your time in school. And so just like where to ask for help, there are so many places that continuously advertise and show you new experiences on campus. And you just have to know where to look at them or um, just be aware of them so you don't just walk blindly by them all the time. So the first really good one is the involvement fair. Uh, a lot of schools call this different things, whether it's like, you know, um, something highlighting their clubs or the different organizations on campus. But typically within the first month of school or so, all the, uh, the, the colleges and universities will put on some kind of demonstration or fair or like uh, session, like in maybe like an intramural gym, you can walk around and just talk to people who are doing different clubs. Like, for example, at John Carroll, it uh, was a small undergrad institution, we had like 3,000 undergraduate students. And we still had over 120 some clubs and 23 club sports. So like there's a ton of activities available on a pretty small college campus. So if you're going to like a Penn State or an Ohio State or uh, something much larger than, than a school of 3,000 people, you'd be amazed at what you can find and what you can do. <clears throat> so don't be afraid to go to those opportunities and just walk around. You can go alone, honestly. If, you, if your friends are being lame your first year and you can't find anybody to drag with you, go by yourself. You'll find a ton of great people to talk to, uh, people who can help you expand your interests and find new things. So go to, those, go to those involvement fairs. Don't be afraid to put down your email and a bunch of stuff. Nothing's binding. You can just unsubscribe from the email list or just delete them later. So if you think you're interested in it, sign up and check it out. Other students, um, start asking around. You know, I'm sure your experience going touring the school, your experience in orientation is not the same as other students' experiences during the same period of time. So even um, among your friends in your first year before you even have a chance to meet older students, you know, ask around like what they've seen that could be interesting because they may have a family member who went there. They may have had a neighbor who went there who knew of different things that you've seen so far. So always just ask like, hey, like, what do you think about doing like this week or do you have any clubs that you joined and see what they say. Uh, the faculty, uh, if you listen to them when they're in classes with you or um, in their office hours, for example, most faculty are somehow associated with some kind of club or have some interest that they're researching or that they're working on. Um, and they're really open about sharing that kind of information. They want to help you with it. So again, it builds on the office hour idea. If you build that relationship, if you find a professor that you connect with and you like what they've been working on, what they talk about, uh, chances are they have some kind of connection on campus that can help you deepen that understanding or explore that further. Orientation is a good way to find out very quickly like the, the width of what's out there to you on campus. Uh, so ask a lot of questions to your orientation advisor. Don't be afraid to be 
uh, pushy about like what they mean by certain clubs or like what like certain clubs do because if they don't know which a lot of them are trained on how to answer a lot of those questions they will pass you along to the person in that club or who has the answer to that question um, so don't don't take I don't know as an answer to keep pushing with especially with orientation staff and they'll be sure to get you the answers you need your RA or your resident assistant uh, sometimes they're called different things but basically it's that the person who's going to be living on your floor in your building your first year um, there to just make sure everything the rules are being followed and that kind of thing everybody's being safe they have to do programs for the people who live on their floor in their building they're always free again you pay for them anyway because you're paying room and board uh, so check them out like a couple of RAs we did like video game tournaments movie nights we did like an ice cream night we did um, like a bake-off with the residence hall across the street from us. Like we had a kitchen in our basement. Like there's a ton of fun stuff that they've organized for you. No, low, very low pressure. You just hang out with your friends who you've met on your uh, floor in your residence hall already. Uh, but it's a good chance to get just a chance to meet new people and see new things and talk to them about what they're doing because they're typically upperclassmen. So you can find out from someone who's been through your shoes what else you could be doing with your time in college. The student union, like the main student hub, as goes with the advertisements, they typically have posters and flyers and people just standing around handing out stuff for advertising for the next activities that are coming up. Um, so don't be afraid to, you know, if you see a big bulletin board of flyers, go check it out because people put a lot of hard work into organizing things that they really care about. Uh, and you'd be surprised at, again, like what will catch your eye and what you'll be interested in. All right, so don't stress about the roommate. This is, uh, I remember uh, as a tour guide, one of the things that I got a lot of questions about and always kind of made me laugh because it, I don't remember being this stressed out about it, this worried about it, but I was questioned so much about what the roommate experience was like, what it was like finding a roommate uh, that I felt like I had to talk about it here today. So first of all, don't be afraid to randomize. Um, there's a good chance that the system works out pretty well for you because school it's not truly random like you will be filling out an online form <clears throat> when it gets to this time normally maybe uh the next month or so month and a half you'll probably get an email about this from from the school about doing a questionnaire about your about your habits like what do you define as clean are you a night owl or an early bird do you like to study in the room do you like to have people over in the room all that kind of stuff uh, if, you, if you answer that honestly the resident's life of the university does a pretty good job of matching that up with you and you'll get someone pretty compatible. Um, with that being said, if you have a friend from high school who is going to the same college as you, feel free to room with them, but just understand that oftentimes it doesn't go very well for both parties. Um, there's just something really different about a friendship that existed, you know, one of them in the hallways or with other people and then you got to go back to your own space that once it's put like in the pressure cooker of an eight by 10 room can really uh, turn sour. So um, I would recommend, recommend that cautiously. And there's nothing wrong with not rooming with a friend. That way you really can make sure you keep them as a friend and you branch out and maybe make some new friends with a roommate and some other people. And you always have that other friend to lean back on. So don't be afraid to randomize. Um, good or bad, your roommate your first year really is just, full of teaching moments it teaches you patience understanding compassion dealing with anger like there's just so much that you can learn from that first year roommate um, that it shouldn't be it shouldn't be a source of stress there's a lot of other things that you're going to be put through your first year of college whether it's adjusting to the classes different schedules being away from home that are also stressful worrying about who's going to be sleeping in the room with you is really not should not be high on your on your biggest list of concerns um, just try to be considerate yourself, treat them like you want to be treated. And if there's issues, speak to them like adults, because you are now like, that's a big part of this whole experience is learning how to deal with people who are different than you. Uh, so don't just run away from any uh, conflict with your roommate, try to handle it like adults. And again, if, if things aren't really going well after the first two months, work with the RA. They are trained on how to mitigate this kind of stuff. You can even move. Uh, they probably aren't, quick to tell you that because it's a real pain for them and it's kind of a an easy way out for a lot of people but you know if it's something that's very toxic and just is not going to work or you feel unsafe they can move you too uh, so if you if you work it out with them and you know you don't think mitigation efforts are really working then 
feel free to request that and see what they say, but um, don't be afraid to involve them because sometimes it takes another party uh, explaining how you feel or explaining someone else's actions for it to really click. Um, so just don't think that if you have to go to the RA for a problem that it means that you're failing as a roommate or anything like that. It just means that you needed better communication. And sometimes that's what those trained people were there for. So don't be afraid of that either. It normally is never anything that, you know, will make you hate your college or make you hate your experience. That'd be a little frustrating at times, but I promise you, if you talk to older friends or um, people who you meet during your time at, at the university or college, just about everybody has a bad roommate experience. Like it's almost unavoidable to the point where it's kind of just a, a joke. Like everybody knows it's going to happen. They say like, if you haven't had a bad roommate, you're the bad roommate. So like, just embrace it. Be ready to accept whatever changes are coming with you and try to have some fun with it because you never know who you might get. All right. <clears throat> the next point goes along with that RA kind of uh, approach is connecting with upper level students. So like I said, at orientation, um, you're going to meet a lot of people your year, that first year. And that's great because those are the people who you're going to be with the longest uh, and you're going to be the closest with. However, it does not give you an excuse to only speak to first year students. Uh, in fact, you really actually do yourself a, a disservice if you ignore the upper level students on campus. They're a great resource, first of all, because they have gone through almost everything you can imagine you've went through. You can find someone who's one or two years older than you who's also done it. So don't be afraid to try to seek them out and find that. That's where those clubs really come in handy and asking for help because there's a much less, there's much less of a divide between the years like there were classes in high school. It's not as stratified as like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year may have been in high school. There's a lot more blending of people who are you know, 27 but a sophomore because maybe they were in the military first versus you who's 19 and a first year student, but like you guys have a lot of shared experiences. So there's a lot more commonality than you might think based on um, your initial concept of college when you get there and you just realize just how diverse and how different everybody's paths are to get to where you are. Uh, so don't be afraid to, to talk to people who uh, maybe you wouldn't have talked to in high school because they were a senior that doesn't exist like it does in high school. Like a college is a much more open place for people just to talk and, and be friends with each other and help each other. So if you join those clubs early, if you do things with your RA early and talk with your professors and try to go to tutoring and like meet these older people, you'll really be surprised at how much you can learn very quickly that they maybe have learned because they failed at it and that's their lesson that they learned and they can just share it with you and you know, skip you some steps and make you a little bit more efficient as you navigate your way around campus. They're also really good for recommendations, advice, you know, when it comes time to register for classes, I promise you, you're going to wish you had some upper level friends who you could talk to and be like, Hey, like, what do you think of the professor X, Y, Z? And they'll say, you know, great class, a couple of papers that are tough, or they'll tell you like lectures are never coherent, never make sense. Like take this one instead you shouldn't have to make that mistake or guess or suffer when there's literally thousands of people out there in the school who probably have had your question or have done the thing that you're, you're weighing options for. So really try to try to build that network. Don't be afraid to ask for phone numbers. Don't be afraid to ask for social media for them. So you can like Snapchat them or check them out on Twitter. Like whatever it takes just to start building that connection is worth it because once, especially once you graduate too, and no one thinks if you're one or two years different between people, that you might have a really great friend for life. So find those upper level students that you can uh, rely on for uh, help and for recommendation and advice, and just to help widen that friend circle because you never know who you're going to meet. Number five, schedules are your friend. Uh, a little bit of a warning, like my personality type, uh, my Myers-Briggs, I'm an ENFJ and very strong J. So I love schedules and things being orderly and on time and stuff like that. So that might be why I'm kind of biased on this one, but I really do think setting time for school and time for yourself is really important when you go to college. Um, I know one of the things that even probably as a senior, I just couldn't believe was how much time I had on my hands. Um, just there's so much more freedom than when you have to be like in a building 
from, I don't know, like 7.30 to three and then do club after school and then go home and then do homework. Like when you're in college, uh, by the time I was a senior, I had class for two hours a day, you know, on two or two and a half hours a day on Tuesday and Thursday only. And I had a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, totally off. Like that completely changes your concept of how much work you need to get done what your timing is like, but what's busy for you. Um, and that changes semesterly too. So if you work on your first year of building a schedule, you get really good at setting out time for school, time for yourself, judging how much you need for both, and then also changing it as your situation changes every semester. It really is important to find your school life balance because too much on either side is not going to work out well for you. Too much on the school side, you're gonna not enjoy your time. You're not going to be developing as much as you could be. You're not gonna be making those connections with other people joining clubs and deepening your knowledge base and finding new interests. You're really just gonna be taking tests and writing papers. And if you're too far on the life side of things, that should go pretty much without explanation. You're not going to do well enough in your classes to pass them in some cases, to move on in some cases, or you know, at the end, maybe be hireable or make it much more difficult for yourself to find a job. Uh, so it's all about striking that balance right away. And that's tricky for you. Uh, and this is another opportunity where finding upperclassmen is really helpful because for example, for me, my first year, I really didn't know um, how to handle it. Like I had a physical paper planner and I did write down like class times. I even blocked in time for studying and for like the gym and for dinner even like just to make sure it was all accounted for in my day. But the balances just weren't right and I wasn't great at managing like this life side of it. Uh, and a friend of mine who was a senior that I met told me uh, a nice piece of John Carroll's campus is there's three main buildings that divide campus in half and just happens to work out that everything south of those buildings was academic. So it was those three buildings, the library, another classroom building, and everything north of those buildings were all the residence halls, the gym, the dining halls, you know, chapels, um, recreation complex, like all the fun stuff. So he's, he told me that when you cross the buildings, the flip, the flip the switch in your head. So when you're going past the buildings on one side, you're all school, work, do all the stuff you have to do. And then when you go to the other side, you're a person again, like you're, have your life ahead of you. Uh, and that was really helpful for me as a freshman. And I only really ever heard that compartmentalization because I had this friend who was a senior. So like whatever works for you, find something that helps you relax and, and helps you focus. Uh, there's two sides of that coin. It's really important to know how to flip that switch and make it both work. And that's where I found a schedule really matters. Um, and hold yourself accountable. I actually had a friend who would Venmo her roommate like $10 if she didn't get a paper done like on a time that she set. Like she set actual punishments for herself because that's the only way she said that she could make herself follow her schedule. Uh, so that's a little extreme. I always thought that was kind of funny, but it, it's really about getting creative and, and finding ways that work for you. <clears throat> so while we're talking about scheduling and work and life and balancing all that stuff, I want to have a word about studying and how important that is when you do go to college. Um, so you want to schedule it. Truthfully, uh, I, I promise you when you get your syllabi at the beginning of the semester and you look at and you see what tests you have coming up, you go, all right, like I'll be okay. And like maybe you try to study like two days before the day before, and maybe that worked in high school. And you know, hopefully that works for you at college, but I can almost promise you it won't anymore. Uh, just things are very different and you have to have a new system in place. Uh, so don't be afraid to whether it's in the Google calendar, um, whether it's in your phone or setting alarms or actually just having a paper calendar like I used to use and write it down, block off time to schedule. Uh, there are plenty of, plenty of studies that show a little bit spaced out for days beforehand is way more effective than 10 hours the night before. And it's more enjoyable for yourself. You do better on the exams. You do better on the papers. If you can space it to give your self time to process it. Um, and that's where scheduling it really comes in handy. So even if you don't go as crazy as I did and schedule out every piece of your day from like when you watch TV, when you run, that kind of stuff, at least block off like, all right, two hours, I have to study today, tomorrow, and Thursday for the exam on Friday. It's just, it's just you'll, you'll be so much better off for it. And I promise you will thank yourself for it when it's over and you've 
gone through it pretty smoothly. Also, you want to find your space. I could not study in my room in my residence hall. I could not study in my apartment when I moved off campus. I can I can barely work from home, honestly. Like even now that I've been working from home for three months, it's hard to focus for me when I'm in the space where I live. So when I was in college, I was I committed to going to the library for everything, whether it was something little like um, just submitting like papers or whether it was um, taking notes on classes that I may have missed or taking um, take home quizzes or you know the list goes on on writing papers, doing other homework assignments. I just committed that I had to go to the library for it. I went to the silent floor. I always had a little like study block room that I used to use uh, to put my headphones in. I worked in the library for as long as it took. And I would maybe schedule that time in. And when my time was up or when the assignment was up, I left the library and didn't think about it anymore. And that's what kept me saying it's what didn't work really well for me. Um, and I know other friends who you know would always study like in certain rooms uh, and like in the business college, if we're unlocked at night, they would just go in there because no one bothered them. And it's all about finding the place that works for you. And if that is your room, congratulations, you're going to save yourself a lot of time and um, stress if you forgot your headphones or not. Um, just make sure you customize it so it really does suit your needs with whatever that might be. Also, uh, a method that works well in high school, like reading through your notes and just kind of remembering what you wrote down, probably isn't going to work anymore. Uh, so just know that now before you learn the hard way and you realize that you can't study the same way. And more importantly, you realize, I don't think I've ever actually been taught how to study. Um, make sure you get comfortable with the idea of quizzing yourself. Um, so there, that's where, you know, places like Quizlet really come in handy. Um, I download an app called Flashcard Machine. I would just like make flashcards for myself if I needed it. Uh, and, and get active with your questioning when you are studying. So if you're reading through your notes, you know, maybe cover up a section with your hand and don't just try to remember like what was on that part of the page, but logically where you were, try to remember, like ask a question, like based on what you've read so far in your notes and see if you can answer it and then match it with what's later in your notes. That's just a good way to know that you're actually retaining it and not just faking memorization or pretending like you know it. Uh, if you can make those quizzes and practice, you'll, you'll be much better off for it. Uh, some people really thrive with a study group. Um, I say find a group with caution because in some instances, I think it works really well. Uh, there was a, a few of us who would get together for a lot of our finance exams right before and just like, make sure we all had the same grasp on formulas and that kind of thing. Um, but I did a lot of the studying on my own, just personally how I liked it. I'm, I was always too social. I talked too much and didn't really get a lot done in a group. Um, and I think you'll find that's how a lot of people actually are. It's studying. It's not really studying. They have way too much fun doing it. Uh, so just be careful. There's nothing wrong with finding a group. You guys, especially if you guys can hold yourself really accountable. Um, maybe take turns creating quizzes based on the material so you uh, don't have any bias when you're trying to answer it and see how well you know, actually know it. Uh, there really are a lot of benefits for a small and dedicated study group if you can find a good one. Um, but with that being said, don't feel pressured if, you know, some friends in your class ask you to study with them and like, you know, they're not, they don't perform all that well, or, you know, they don't focus or care about the, enough about the class. Don't feel pressured to join that group. You, you can do it on your own. I did most of the time. You'll be okay. Um, so just be careful when you're looking for a group to join. And also front load your semesters. Uh, I think this is a really um, weird concept or Maybe it's hard to imagine until you actually get into a college class, but this is probably the thing that I discovered for myself that made the biggest difference in my enjoyment of the semester and my sanity at the end of the year. So everybody will make a joke about the first week being syllabus week and no one really doing anything. That's kind of true. I, I had some, it was a mix. Like some classes were full steam like from day one, others really eased into it. You know, you'll get a good mix of that. Um, but it's really important that you don't confuse the gradual increase in pace with uh, the class being easy or not requiring work. So I always found the beginning of the semester when you don't have anything going on is the best time to 
be super diligent with your studying, with your scheduling, with creating time for yourself to be in the library or wherever you need to get work done and working ahead. Um, I typically would try to work at least two classes ahead on homework because you never knew if you had questions that might come up and it might be too late to ask. Uh, and for me, at least, it helped me focus during the lectures because I had an idea of what was being asked of me and what was deemed important enough uh, and allowed me to think a little bit differently when you're just sitting there listening to a lecture. And then bonus points, it helps you do really well on the early assignments that other people might blow off. And then when you get to the end of the semester, you don't need to pull off you know, a miraculous like 100% of the final to get a B. You can typically just do what you normally did and you'll be okay. Um, so it's, it's just like, instead of doing, you know, all of your work in the last three, four weeks of the semester, just spread it out and just accept the fact that you're in school, you have to do work. I think you'll find that in college, some people are like, oh, I'm in college, I don't have to do this. And I'll just do, I'll just do it at the end, it'll be okay. And that's not really the case. Um, that was one thing that I guess worked very well with like the school system in high school, regular assignments, like pushing you, which sometimes can be way too much and, and really stressful, I know, but um, getting in the habit of always working, or at least a little bit, uh, keeps you sharp, and I, I think it made a big difference for my semesters. So don't be afraid, you know, if other people aren't doing something, don't be afraid to be uncomfortable with that and want to get something done and work on what you see on the syllabus or just start getting ahead for what you know will help you later because it does make a big difference. And then lastly, working on your financial literacy. Now, I say this with a little bit of bias since I was a finance major uh, and come the end of my senior year, I had to help a lot of friends with like credit card applications and like budgeting for how much they could afford for rent and stuff. So I've seen this from people who weren't in the business school or weren't in finance majors. Really, just when you're improving your financial literacy in school, uh, it's really important to learn to save first. I know <clears throat> Warren Buffett has a, a famous expression that you should um, spend when you're done saving, not save when you're done spending. Um, so that's in college too. Like you'll find it's really easy to blow a lot of money very quickly because your friends are going to want to go out to eat. There's always going to be cool things to be doing. Um, and you should, like you absolutely should do things with your friends and go check out stuff in the cities around your colleges or go explore the museums and that kind of stuff. Uh, just make sure that you have rent covered once you move off campus. Make sure you have your groceries covered before you do all that kind of stuff because it's really easy, surprisingly, to get in, into more debt than just your student debt when you're in college. Um, <clears throat> there was actually a recent study I was reading in either Washington Post or CNBC that over a third of college students graduate with more than $1,000 in credit card debt um, on top of their other student loans. And, and let's just be honest, in, in college, your interest rate's terrible. So you're, that's a pretty expensive mistake to be making at 19, 20, 21. Um, so just be aware of that going in and, and do your best to try to avoid it. So surprise, surprise, tracking, budgeting, another way of saying scheduling, the way your money moves. Um, just be aware of how much you're spending. Don't just, you know, don't just get a credit card and put it all on it. Don't just turn your parents into walking ATMs. Like really be mindful of what you're doing, where it's going, and identify those patterns because that's a skill that people don't have in their 30s and 40s, honestly. And it'll really just help you out over the long term. If you can comfortably know where what your money's going and what you're doing with it, it alleviates a lot of stress and allows you to actually enjoy what you're spending your money on. Um, use a credit card responsibly. Uh, I'd recommend for college students, I do think it's important to get a credit card with a low limit and use it for emergencies just to show that um, one, you can build a credit history because when you try to get out of school and rent an apartment or a house or buy a car, if you don't have any credit, it's really going to affect you, make things a little bit more difficult for you. So don't be afraid of of having a credit card. Uh, like Discover makes a really good student card that is low rates and um, has a pretty decent cash back for, for the credit limit that it uh, accepted for. So look into that. Uh, Nerd Wallet's really good. Um, US News and Real Report does really good stuff with different credit cards um, information. And I would definitely recommend getting one because even if you don't use it, having a line of credit out there is helpful in emergencies. It's also helpful for lenders to know that you are responsible. Uh, so keep that in mind. Don't be afraid of it, but don't just think of it as free money because it's not.
All right, so that is what I have for you as a little intro on what to expect when you're transitioning to college. Those are my six main uh, areas that I think you should keep in mind when you are going to college in the fall. Uh, so as for what's next, I have a couple handles up there for me, RPM High Perform on Twitter and Instagram. Obviously, the South Fayette and Bridgeville Libraries. Make sure you follow them, share the love for helping organize this tonight. Uh, and also, please join us next week on the 17th, same time on Zoom. Carrie has the information for that as well. We'll be doing a similar session, about an hour long Zoom, on uh, a guide to finding jobs and internships uh, while you're in college and how you can do that beginning your first year uh, as a way to help make some extra money, get some really good experience, uh, and round out your college experience. So with that, <clears throat> thank you all so much for being here this evening. I appreciate, I know you just got out of school and here's more school related things. I, I do appreciate you caring and wanting to take this next step for you. Uh, so with that, if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat. Uh, if not, that's all. And I'll turn it back over to Carrie. Um, guys, I also put in my email information in the chat as well. And um, I, so obviously I've been, the, I went to college and I'm actually in grad school right now as well. And everything that Ryan put into this tonight is totally on point. Um, and I was an RA in college as well, a residence assistant. And everything that he said, like we do have to have training, um, we do have to have training on how to handle any type of roommate, um, like conflicts that might arise or other things like that. And we have specific trainings for specific scenarios. So if you are having like problems with roommates or anything like that, one, Brian is right, that shouldn't be like your first priority is like worrying about roommates because it's, it's just like living with your family, right? Like you're going to have some conflicts that happen. <laughs> And it's okay, it's going to happen, but it's how you handle it and how you um, talk with that person and how you seek out help. So I'm so glad that you guys were here. Um, I'm going to give it like a minute or so more for questions just in case. And please don't be afraid to write in the chat um, because we're here for you. We're here and doing this program for you guys and to make this a good experience for you. So please feel free to put anything in the chat. Um, but Ryan, I want to make sure to thank you for tonight. This was awesome. You had so many good points. <laughs> and um, I'm really excited about ne next week as well, talking about internships and, and jobs, which is great. So well, thank you for organizing this. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, yeah. If there's no other questions, then I guess have a great evening. Try to get outside yeah. and enjoy the nice weather for a little bit. It's not too hot. Oh. Sun going we down. have a hand. All right, cool. All right. Thanks, guys, so much. I hope you have a great night. Thanks for joining us. And hopefully you'll join us next week. Yes. All right. <laughs> all right, hope to see you all there. Take care.